Welcome to our first 2014 Studies in Islam lecture. My name is Idrissa Pandit. I am the Director of Studies in Islam program here at Renison University College. Now, before I introduce our topic and our speaker, uh, just a little bit about um, our own program. Studies in Islam is a very young program here at University of Waterloo. It's housed at Renison. It's an interdisciplinary academic uh, arts minor and diploma. And uh, we've been in existence for about four years now. Um, since our inception, our goal has been um, to uh, implement the, and intentionally uh, work on the university community connection. Um, and we've really uh, tried to play and be a bridge um, uh, between the university and community through our um, outreach programs. Alongside the academic learning in the classroom, uh, we have embraced projects that have shaped and nurtured dialogue beyond this campus um, at a local, national, as well as international level. Every fall uh, here at Renison, we host a Jewish Muslim Christian workshop series on a topic of common interest, where the attendees are active participants in the dialogue. We also host a scriptural reasoning group, which brings together scholars of the three Abrahamic faiths who engage in a vigorous yet respectful dialogue with the goal of building understanding and peace. Tonight's lecture is one among such opportunities to help build understanding on an issue that is hotly debated as well as contested in the realm of academe, political circles, as well as the popular media. There is no consensus in research on whether Islamophobia is a distinct othering phenomenon or is it just another shade of racism, prejudice and xenophobia. While Islamophobia as a term gained popularity after 9-11, a survey of literature shows that this term was in use as early as 1920. The first real definition of Islamophobia as, quote, aversion to Islam and Muslims, unquote, appears in the 1997, uh, which became a famous study, Runnymede Trust Report, published in Great Britain. Regardless of debate over definitions, the fear of Islam and Muslims is a reality in the world we live in today. As per the 2011 Center for American Progress report called Fear Inc., there is also a well-funded Islamophobia industry with merely seven charitable groups providing over $42 million between the years of 2001 and 2009 to Islamophobic think tanks. To help us understand and unpack all the ambiguities associated with Islamophobia, in the post 9-11 world, we look forward to hearing Professor Muhammad's lecture tonight. Let me tell you a little bit about Professor Aid Muhammad, our guest. Professor Muhammad received his doctorate in American studies from George Washington University, where he specialized in Middle Eastern studies, modern Arab history and culture, and US Middle East encounter. In 2011, after completing his PhD, Muhammad was appointed as a visiting assistant professor at the State University of New York in Binghamton, where he taught and also helped develop the Center for Middle East and North African Studies. In 2012, he was a visiting fellow at Brookings Doha Center and a visiting assistant professor at Qatar University. Currently, Dr. Muhammad is a research fellow at the Balsili School of International Affairs at the University of Waterloo and an adjunct professor at the University of Guelph in Canada here in our town. His research interests are centered around interplay of religion, pop culture and politics, and the role they play in shaping the complex relations between America and the nations and peoples of the Middle East. His forthcoming book is called Arab Occidentalism, Images of America in the Middle East. Please join me in welcoming Professor Muhammad. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to be here. 
Uh, today I'm going to talk about Islamophobia and this research actually uh, covers the term in U.S. Um, um, news stories before and after 9-11, but it covers it in after 9-11 for about five to six years only. So up till like 2007, 2008. And um, as I said, we, 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 I'm trying to offer reading through a number of US newspapers, headlines before and after um, the 9-11 attacks. And um, even the term that has been used so commonly in the US papers after 9-11 um, proves in, in these news stories that it has some kind of ambiguous meaning and uh, sometimes it refers to something different than the, um, the, um, um, the origin of the word or for the, the, the task for which it has been coined. And the, the term has been coined in, in Great Britain in 1996 and used formally actually in um, the self-proclaimed commission on British Muslims and Islamophobia. And the word literally means undue fear uh, from Islam. However, it is used to mean prejudice against Muslims. And it joins more than 500 other phobias spanning virtually every aspect of life. The term has achieved a degree of linguistic and political acceptance to the point that the Secretary General of the United Nations in, in 2004 on December, uh, in December 2004, uh, the United Nations presided a conference entitled Confronting Islamophobia. And also in May 2005, a Council of Europe summit condemned Islamophobia. So the American media and the media of many other Western countries um, soon after 9-11 tended to link Islam and Muslims in general uh, with 9-11 attacks. This was the time when a number of terrorists, you all know about 9-11, hijacked some American airplanes from airports and used them to attack the Pentagon, the two towers of the Wall Trade Center, uh, the twin tower of the Wall Trade Center in New York, and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. The Wall Trade Center is a sample of America's economic supremacy, while the Pentagon stands for its military power. Islam and Muslims have been described by the U.S. media as the source of terrorism soon after 9-11, and religious fanaticism and cultural backwardness, etc. Moreover, some US, U.S. politicians followed the media and referred to the same picture of Islam and Muslims. This was extremely evident when uh, the former U.S. President George W. Bush used the term crusade to describe his war on terrorism recalling the famous wars waged by the West against Arabs and Muslims in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. Meanwhile, Muslims are being asked to reform their educational programs so they may be kept at distance from radical Islam. In the US, this wave of fear and hatred against Islam and Muslims is defined by the term Islamophobia which was initiated in Europe in the 1990s. The term was rarely mentioned in the US newspapers before 9-11. However, it becomes increasingly common soon after. For example, I used the LexisNexis to make the search in the US newspapers. And before 9-11, throughout the history of the United States, the term yields only 41 stories in which the term is mentioned. Within three, within three months after 9-11, the term was mentioned in only 12 stories in the US newspapers. And from September 11, 2001 till September 11, 2002, the term return, um, recurred in 35 stories. Then from September 11, 2002 till September 11, 2003, it appeared in 22 articles. So you feel or, or you, you can find how the term increased over, over years. And surprisingly, after that, there came a wave of increase in the use of the term. From September 2003 to September 2004, the term was mentioned in 44 stories, double um, the year before it. This number increased in the following year to 82 double as well. The rise continued in the period between September 11, 2005 to September 11, 2006, for example, in one year, the term was mentioned 117 times. And in the following year, the number increased and reached 211 occurrences in U.S. newspapers. Thus, since September 11, 2001 and up, uh, up until now, stories mentioned 
mentioning the term in popular US newspapers continue to increase. And the objective of this research is to trace the meaning of Islamophobia in US press coverage since 9-11 and to throw light, oh sorry, we have to go to this one, and to throw light on the, the various meanings of the term and the, 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 the multifaceted connotations associated with the term since 9-11 up till this moment. And the paper um, addresses one decisive question that needs to be answered. What are the different uses of Islamophobia in US newspapers after 9-11 until 2008? A study of the usage of the term in US, paper, uh, news, U.S. newspapers after 9-11 indicates the extent to which the term had an occasionally changeable meaning during the last few years. People are still confused about Islamophobia as a term and about its existence or inexistence in life. What is, expo what is expressed in U.S. newspapers is but a reflection of the ambiguity of the term itself about which long discussions have taken place in U.S. media. Sometimes the term seems to be a hat track on which people hang their political inclinations and hidden agendas. Over time, the term proves to have a, very, uh, um, uh, a verifiable existence. And this study endeavors to follow the, the analytic, analytical approach as a method of research so that the nature and background of Islamophobia can be revealed and the main tenets shared by the different definition of Islamophobia in U.S. newspapers can be rendered and compared. And there is also uh, the comparative approach that will be used to verify the validity of the argument about Islamophobia and to check whether the concept is a myth or reality and through analyzing the U.S. press coverage of Islamophobia, we have these three different meanings. So, Islamophobia denotes speech and behavior that are derogatory to all Muslims and Arabs. In this sense, Islamophobia is a horrible disease that needs to be diagnosed and treated. So we're talking about all Muslims and Arabs, more than 1.5 billion um, people live all over the world, and all of them are to be afraid from, and all of them are to be considered like terrorists. So this is like the extreme meaning of Islamophobia. And the second meaning is fear of Muslims and Arab terrorists. Such fear is exemplified in the traumatic attacks of 9-11 and other horrible attacks in different areas of the world in which Muslims and Arabs were allegedly involved. This usage makes the term seen in the right place because the users of the term confine it to the doers of these murderous attacks. And they require Muslims and Arabs to better introduce themselves and their religion into the Western societies so that this phobia can be eliminated. The third meaning um, that recurred in some of the US uh, news stories and newspapers, Islamophobia is a myth or invention that is used by Muslims and Arabs in defense of themselves and their religion against any kind of criticism. So in this usage, the term stands as an illegitimate shield against the legitimate action and speech. The term itself turns into a threat to the US. At this usage of the term makes use of people's agitation toward any discrimination based on religious belief or ethnicity. The term is seen by some as no more than a method of deception or a trick that is used to draw attention to a buzzword that hides illegal content. One of the challenges that face my study of using the term Islamophobia in U.S. newspapers is that identifying what each article is trying to prove requires a detailed analysis of a large number of articles so that the valid conclusion can be reached. In fact, since 9-11 until 2009, a corpus of five um, until the beginning of 2009, the end of 2008. 556 stories about the term was written in U.S. newspapers. Thus, the research method sought allows me to, go, to gain an overview of a wide-ranging corpus. And this can be achieved through the me method of search available at LexisNexis, which provides articles with the term Islamophobia in headlines and delete paragraphs. This method of search, which produces 93 articles published between um, September 11, 2001 till December 5, uh, 2007, guarantees a considerably wide audience. So instead of like looking at every single term of Islamophobia mentioned anywhere in the, 
in the U.S. news stores. I focus only on those that have um, uh, Islamophobia as the main topic of the article itself. So then these 90, if you look at these, these are the names, I know it's very small, but these are the names of the newspapers and how many times we have articles about Islamophobic actions taken or um, uh, taking place against the Muslims in the US. Um, the importance of this paper lies in proposing different interpretations of Islamophobia as a term and in showing the contradicting nature of some of these interpretations. Let's start with the first one, Islamophobia, anti-Muslim racism. Soon after the fatal attacks of 9-11, the Americans began to ask questions about the unknown enemies called the Muslims and Arabs. They turned it to media to find answers to these questions. And this is true. In 2003, I was visiting the United States. I was in a visit to many states, one of them in California and San Francisco. And I met some people there. And I was introduced as someone from Egypt. And then he, someone came to me asking me, is, is Egypt close to Washington, D.C.? So many Americans actually, before 9-11, they have no idea where is the Arab wallet, where is the Middle East, and some of them consider America as being the whole wallet. So they turned it to media to find the answers to the, their questions. And the answers were given by analysts and reporters who have little or no knowledge of the Muslim and Arab history, culture, and values. And also some politicians tend to exploit the public fear and anger for their own political agendas. So um, we have, for example, Pat Robertson said that the Muslims were worse than Nazis. And we have Jerry Falwell described the Prophet Muhammad as a terrorist while preacher Jerry Vines described him as a demon-obsessed uh, pedophile. And this all has been mentioned in uh, Pentax's book, Reflections in a Bloodshed Lens, America, Islam, and the War of Ideas. Uh, Ann Coulter, one of America's most controversial commentators, wrote in a column published in September 13, 2001, and was quickly uh, quoted and around the whole world. She said, quote, we should invade Muslim countries, kill their leaders, and convert them to Christianity." Unquote. And although millions of Muslims worldwide have denounced and condemned the deadly attacks of, uh, on the World Trade Center Pentagon, and the image of Arabs and Muslims is still growingly tarnished after 9-11. A 2006 poll conducted by the ABC News in, and the Washington Post showed that almost half of all Americans expressed an unfavorable opinion of Muslims and Arabs. 45% think Islam does not teach respect for the beliefs of non-Muslims. Nearly six in 10 people think Islam is prone to violence. This is conducted by ABC News and the Washington Post. On September 8, 2001, the United Nations Wallet Conference Against Racism issued the following statement, quote, we also recognize with deep concern the increase in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in various parts of the world, as well as the emergence of racial and violent movements based on racism and discriminatory ideas against the Jewish, Muslim, and Arab communities, unquote. That the conference concluded that there is a connection between the terms anti-Semitism, Islamophobia in one hand, and uh, the term racism on the other. In this sense, the two terms transcended the limited meaning of, a hating, uh, of hating a certain Jewish, Muslim, or Arab group into hating all the Jews, all Muslims, and all Arabs. And this confession by the United Nations that there is something alive called Islamophobia is not isolated from real life. Stories abound in US newspapers regarding Islamophobia as a phenomenon in the American society after 9-11. In fact, the term Islamophobia existed before 9-11, but the murderous attacks of 9-11 made it more visible as if it were newly coined in the U.S. According to the today's quote column in the Houston Chronicle during a day-long U.S. seminar on Islamophobia, the following statement was given by former U.S., uh, sorry, United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. Quote, when a new word enters the language, it's often, this is what he said. Oh, I hate technology. 
Yes. This is what's said by Kofi Annan. When a new word enters the language, it's often the result of a scientific advance or a diverting fact. But when the world is compelled to coin a new term to take account of increasingly widespread bigotry, that is a sad and troubling development, such is the case with Islamophobia. Uh, of course, after 9-11, Isla Islamophobia became a, host a hot issue on most U.S. news channels. However, even before 9-11, the issue of Islamophobia was present on these channels. The pre-9-11 um, Islamophobia phenomenon is evident in a statement published in the U.S. Newswire on August 22, 2001. According to a, na a national report released today by a prominent national Islamic advocacy group, incidents of anti-Muslim discrimination rose 15% in the past year. This was before 9-11. And that report, titled Accommodating Diversity and published by the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, details more than 360 incidents and experiences of anti-Muslim violence, discrimination, stereotyping, bias, and harassment. That was before 9-11. The report relates incidents, many of which involved denial of religious accommodation in the, work, in the workplace, 48%, or schools, 15%, and included 30 Muslim employees in Minnesota who worked off their job because they were denied the right to pray a correctional, uh, uh, to pray in, in their place, in workplace, in their workplace. A correctional officer in New York who was denied the right to wear a beard. A woman in Illinois who was fired for wearing a religiously mandated headscarf. Muslim students in Virginia who were told that they could no longer hold obligatory Friday prayers in school. And even shotgun attack against um, Muslims in a mosque in Tennessee that left one worshiper wounded. This was, again, before 9-11. The events of 9-11 and the rhetoric accompanying the U.S.-led war on terror have heightened anti-Arab and anti-Muslim sentiments, giving credence to co confrontational theories such as Samuel Hunting's clash of civilization. It's not strange that the term Islamophobia recurs in U.S. newspapers in the post-9-11 era more than it does in the newspapers of any other Western country. It's evident as well that anti-Islamic sentiment in the country swelled in the aftermath of the terror um, of the terror attacks of September 11. This swell of hatred is due to the horrible events that were connected with Islam and Muslims. In the Houston Chronicle, Melanie, uh, Melanie Markley wrote an article entitled Condemning Islamophobia. Recent attacks raise fears of the new rash of crimes against Muslims. Markley stated that, quote, last week's attempted fire Firebombing of an Islamic center in El Paso represents the latest in a renewed rash of hate crimes against Muslims in Texas. The director of Houston's Council on American Islamic Relations Care said um, in a letter to the editor of Herald News, Quote, Muslims frequently have to deal with people using terms such as radical Islamists and Islamic, Islamic fanatics, etc. As a Muslim who has grown up in, a Muslim, in Muslim countries, these terms hold no meaning for me. But I recognize that they work to promote a fear of Islam and Muslims among our fellow Americans. Due to 9-11 attacks, fear accompanied or followed by hatred of all Muslims and Arabs became common in American society. All Muslims and Arabs are now associated with terrorism, violence, radicalism, Islamism, and Al-Qaeda. The radicalization and fanaticism frequently referred to are not a function or product of Islam and therefore should not be associated with Islam. True, there are maybe Muslims, Christians, or Jews who commit violence acts in the name of their religions, but it's important to realize that their religions don't condone these acts of violence." Unquote. Here we noted the explanation of the phenomenon itself as a phobia where fear of a few is repre represented as fear held by all. Islamophobia is criticized by uh, this Muslim American because it's a term that should be used in describing terrorists, in describing radicals or fanatics, not all Muslims and Arabs. And the writer believes that this phobia is unjustified if it's a feeling toward a whole race or a certain ethno-religious group. 
In, in a book titled The Confronting Islamophobia and Education Practice, um, Lorianne Sheridan indicates that interest in knowing Islam and Muslim increased after 9-11, but did not always lead to greater understanding or acceptance of Islam and Muslims. I think we, we, we talked about those analysts and politicians who came after 9-11 um, announcing themselves as experts on Middle East, Islam and Muslims, and misinforming the people about the religion. And Sheridan connects the lack of understanding of Islam and accepting a Muslim with the increase in the number of hate crimes against the Muslims in the West, especially after 9-11. Sheridan also adds in this book that in the 9-11 attacks, Islam went from anonymous to terrorist. The writer states that the FBI rec records indicate that hate crimes against the Arabs and Muslims in the U.S. increased by how many times? Can you expect how many times increased the crimes against the Muslims? 1,700 times after 9-11. And the book indicates that the increase in hate crimes against Muslims and Arabs is built on Islamophobic attitudes toward this race and this religion. And the book lays much emphasis on the importance of education in the process of confronting this violent wave of Islamophobia. I remember in 2007, while I was in Washington, D.C., I met with a committee coming from Egypt um, with some members from Al-Azhar University and other uh, universities in Egypt to go over invited by the, culture of the Egyptian culture office in Washington, D.C. to go over the um, curriculum, the American curriculum in elementary and secondary schools. And they discovered a lot of information that is actually incorrect about um, Islam and Muslims. And they asked the ambassador of Egypt to arrange for a meeting with someone in the Ministry of Education or Department of Education in the U.S. And when they met with the guy um, representing the Minister of Education in the U.S., he promised to take care of it. And since 2007, till this moment, nothing happened in this. So, what is proposed in this book about the importance of confronting Islamophobia in the field of education leads us to observe the mix between Muslims and Arabs. This is an important point. And the way the term Islamophobia is used, the usage of the term regards all Arabs and Muslims, and all Muslims are Arabs, and make all of them subject to the same post 9-11 hate crimes. Now, let's come to some facts. Muslim Arabs make up only how many? 15% of the, the wallets, 1.5, more than 1.5 billion Muslims. And the biggest numbers of Muslims are found where? Indonesia. Not in Egypt, not in Indonesia. Saudi Arabia, not in any other Arab country, in Indonesia. Yes, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Malaysia, China, all of these countries, they have Muslims more than any Arab country. Indonesia by itself has Muslims more than those living in the whole entire Arab wallet. This invites us to study the term not only from a religious perspective, but also from a racial one. There is a general trend that views all Muslims as belonging to a single race, and that regards their political goals as one and the same. In an article published in the Monitor, while discussing a French, uh, the French president, uh, Nicolai Sarkozy, expected policy on immigration, this was a long time ago, the, the, the writer of this article uh, states, quote, the most intriguing issues are immigration and policy in, uh, in the greater Middle East, all Arab nations, Iran, Turkey, and Israel, traditional ties with the Arab world, historically tangled relations with Israel, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, claims to a special role in Mideastern settlement, a search for a place in the world arena and one's own identity, and the impact of the domestic, political, and socio-demographic situation on foreign policy is this about Russia or France? 
Again, Islamophobia is linked also to the Middle East and the Arab world, and this is affirmed in the same story, in this same article that published in the Monitor. A number of Muslim countries are wary about Sarkozy's Islamophobic image, all the more so considering his Jewish roots and friendship with Israel. So Muslims all over the world are worried about the, um, the Sarkozy's immigration policies because he has some ties with the Jewish community and he is pro-Israel. So it's not about Islam, it's about the Middle East and the Arab world. And the link between Sarkozy's Islamophobic image and his friendship with Israel, while the struggle in the Middle East frequently called the Arab-Israel conflict, it's not called the Islamic-Israel conflict, so I certainly the fact that Arabs and Muslims are always perceived as identical. And we have a problem also on the other side. Any Western is American. And this is what I'm trying to do in my book, Arab Occidentalism. When you talk to people in any Arab country, especially those who are, um, um, who are not well educated, and you mention the West, people will talk to you about America. As if the whole West is only, um, is only American. So the way the link between race and religion is obvious in US newspapers after 9-11 calls attention to some voices that equate Islamophobia with racism. Abdul Jalil Sajid, chairman of the Muslim Council for Religion and Racial Harmony in the United Kingdom, refers to this in his article, Islamophobia, a new word for an old fear. He stated that Islamophobia is a new form of racism. It's worth noting that the primary sources of US newspapers used in this study regarding Muslims and Arabs everywhere as, I wanna go to this, yeah. And actually this happened at George Washington University while I was a graduate student in the same university. In Philadelphia, an inquiry article, the following stereotypes were mentioned among other post-9-11 ones. Muslim equals Arab equals unscrupulous, pathological, fanatic, or terrorist with primitive motives. This is um, after 9-11. These stereotypes about Arabs and Muslims continue to be fueled by Hollywood images, media cliches, and just the plain ignorance. They include the three Bs which is any Arab, any Muslim in this world is one of three. Bomber, belly dancer, billionaire. And this was also evident in what was published by the Washington Post about flyers that appeared all over the camps of George Washington University. And camps police moved quickly to remove the flyer. This is the flyer. And university leaders began investigating how they got there and the student groups they met last night to, um, uh, uh, to deplore the posters which had a photo of an Arab and description of typical Muslim features as suicide vest, hidden AK-47, I think this is a weapon, and pig leg of smuggling children and heroin, etc. And in the poster shown um, here, it's evident that Muslim and Arab are regarded as being the same. And this takes us to what can be called political culture, introducing political views into the cultural arena. In fact, the last few decades of the relationship between the West and the Middle East were governed by such kinds of politics-oriented cultural themes. It's evident that no line of um, demarcation is drawn between what is political and what represents people's culture. Pot politics muddies the cultural atmosphere. And that's why we find terms like Islamophobia becoming an ambiguous combination of contradictory meanings. Media, again, heavily contribute to shaping and settle the cultural views on such a term by introducing so many interpretations of the same term with respect to a vast array of desperate incidents. Actually, this problem of U.S. press coverage has been addressed in certain panel discussions in which some Muslim scholars repeatedly refer to the misuse of certain terms of the Islamic culture. This misuse results in conveying negative meanings to the American reader. While I was conducting my dissertation at George Washington University, I brought a lot, many, many um, references 
And when I try to check, to check the bibliography of these references, rarely you find any reference coming from the Middle East. Like most people, like writing their books, depending on other references, which they use also other American references, which they use other Western references, without any um, uh, uh, mention of any um, Middle Eastern or Islamic writer into uh, these references. And, and, and this again leads to some kind of misinforming people about Islam and Muslims. And um, I was talking to, uh, um, attending a panel in uh, MISA, Middle East Association, talking to one of the top, I'm not going to mention his name, but one of the top names in the field. And he, he, we're talking about Islamophobia, stuff like that. And he brought to me a verse from the Quran, the translation of this verse. And look, look what the Quran states in this about uh, waging a war against non-Muslims for no reason, etc. And when I told him that this, this verse has been canceled by another verse, which is called in Arabic, Naskh. This means that some verses came to the Prophet for a certain incident, and then the, the ones that came for whatever is going to happen again with Muslims throughout their history has came after that verse. So the first one has been canceled already. So he didn't know about Nasr, about any of the stuff I'm talking about. So this tells you how many people um, who speak about or who announce themselves to be experts on Islam and Muslims, unfortunately, they have no idea about it. And they have to go there and study. Um, just like when I came to study American studies, I didn't study it in Egypt. I came to the United States to study about American studies. I was asked one time at the airport by the officer, um, what are you studying here? I said American studies. So what is American studies? I told them I'm studying you. <laughs> I was surprised. <laughs> The University Wire, uh, in the University Wire, Amina McLeod, professor of Islamic world studies at DePaul University, focused on how to m the misuse of language has led to misunderstandings of Islam. Jihad, for example, traditionally refers to personal struggle with temptation and desire, but has come to be associated with, solely with the Holy War. Today at uh, the 570 News, I got a question about Jihad. And uh, um, as, as Professor Amina mentioned uh, here, throughout the history of the um, Islam, the term, the most recurrent use of the term is about personal struggle against Satan or against the um, temptation and desire. It is through the use of such terms that ambiguous definition also became attached to even non-Muslims. And um, phobia is always connected with the unknown or the unseen. In promoting this kind of Islamophobia, some news channels tend to make the term seem as if it were made up of a collection of different things. The combination of what is a phobia uh, it's in itself. It's generally accepted that phobia arises from a combination of external events and internal predispositions. It's also believed that, that genetics, brain chemistry, and life experience combine to play a major role in the development of an anxiety disorder and phobia. Hence, we can say that the Islamophobia is not the outcome of the late 20th century. It's, it has something to do with the relation between the East and the West throughout its history. Islam is always connected with the Arab world, which is an area of interest in the Middle East and an area of interest to all colonial powers. Um, it's, it's not only about the 20th century or the 21st century. To the Western people, Islam and the Arab world are almost the same. So this kind of phobia has always been there in the Western heritage. It passed from one generation to another. Before 9-11, the term was connected to the struggle between Arabs and Israel. More, moreover, before the 20th century, this kind of distrust and mutual fear between East and the West was there since the Crusades. This leads us to the second meaning of Islamophobia in newspapers. Islamophobia is fear. The fear of Muslim or Arab terrorists. The term Islamophobia cannot be extricated from its origin, Islam and phobia. 
And the word Islam refers to the religion founded in the Arabian Peninsula more than 1400 years ago. And the Arabic word Islam is derived from the root Salima, this is in Arabic, which means to be in peace. Or Salama, which means to surrender. So the word Islam means peace and surrender. And in, 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 in explaining why peace and surrender, we should say that Islam is, as a religion, refers to both meanings at the same time. It means surrendering oneself to God's will and thus enjoy the peace of mind and soul. So if you surrender to God, you feel peace uh, of mind. So the suffix phobia usually means fear. But in the term Islamophobia, its use is similar to its appearance in homophobia, which where prejudice or hate are more precise usages than just fear. In The Plain Dealer, Kevin O'Brien wrote an article entitled Islamophobia is a smoke stream. He stated, quote, it's nonsense to imply that Americans fear everything about Islam. What Americans fear when they give Islam any thought at all is the segment of that, or the segment of it that uses violence to promote its agenda. Nor are Americans in, in, enthralled with the agenda itself. Ohio may not want casinos, but it doesn't want Sharia law, a state religion or governor who, who issues a daily fatwa either. Unquote. So O'Brien makes fear of Islam and Muslims connected to not with Islam as a religion or with its adherence in general, but with what is announced as part of Islam by the so-called Muslim terrorists and they're promoting violence and terror. So you take this part of Islam from the terrorists. When the terrorists say something about Islam, oh, this is Islam, we have to take care of that part. But it's not something announced by the majority of Muslims. The segment of Islam to which remains the source of this phobia about Islam. This is the segment announced by those who promote violence and terror. In Philadelphia, an inquirer, Gloria, uh, Gloria Goldman stat stated, quote, Islam should be feared because it's an oppressive and aggressive religion. It exerts control over people through bondage and fear and does not permit individuals to think for themselves, unquote. The unknown is always unjustly judged. Unfortunately, Islam is taken from the mouths of terrorist rifles. And it is to be noted that this article regards fear as connected with Islam as a religion rather than with the people who, follows it, who follow it. But why? Why at this time of the late 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, the people in the West, in the West started to fear Islam and look, to look at Muslims um, in fear? Islam has existed for more than 1400 years, during which there have been so many clashes between the Islamic world and the West, yet the term Islamophobia has never been there. Even during the Crusades, the aim announced by the West was to rescue the Christians and recover the Holy Land and from Arabs and Muslims. But again, the aim was not called Islamophobia. It's also strange that the term which deals back to the early 1990s appeared after the West, the US and its allies had become the ultimate and only global power after the breakdown of the Soviet Union. Here we should refer to something that backs up the supremacy of the West, the increasing number of Muslims in the West. Islam is the second largest religion after Christianity in most European countries, as well as in the US itself. This kind of fear is expressed in the U.S. press um, by former Republican Congressman Virgil Good. In uh, St. Pittsburgh Times, he stated, quote, I fear that in the next century we'll have many more Muslims in the United States if we don't adopt strict immigration policies that I believe are necessary to preserve the values and beliefs traditional to the United States of America and to prevent our resources from being swamped. Okay, trying to wrap up. So he fears that the culture and bombs that might destroy the American values and traditions, which is why he calls for closing the US borders to prevent those Muslims or Arabs from stepping with their cultural goods into US soil. 
This is a strange proposal from a U.S. Pro uh, politician. In fact, he needs to remember that the U.S. is a multicultural nation. Multiculturalism is part and parcel of the U.S. identity. So why fear of Islam in particular? He went on to say, quote, the Ten Commandments and in God we trust are on the wall of my office. A Muslim student came to by my office and asked why I did not have anything on my wall about the Quran. My response was clear. As long as I have the honor of representing the citizens of the 5th District of Virginia in the United States House of Representatives, the Quran is not going to be on the wall of my office." Unquote. Thus, it's evident that fear does not always come from rifles and bombs. Sometimes it comes from cultures and thoughts. In a book published in 1999, John Esposito, the professor at Georgetown University, indicated that with the breakdown of the Soviet Union, Islam constituted the most pervasive and powerful force in the world. It has been all too tempting to identify another global ideological menace to fill the threat vacuum created by the damage of communism. And this has something to do with the work of Edward Said and um, looking at self and the other and how to build up your identity by uh, destroying the identity of the other in order to be civilized, you have to have some uncivilized nations. So you refer to your, these nations by saying we are civilized because those people are not civili civilized. And we are educated because those people are not educated. And it has been even used in the um, um, war against terror and invading Iraq. Um, um, George W. Bush talked about going in there to educate people and to save them from uh, themselves. And uh, this book, which appeared before 9-11, the book by John Esposito, discusses whether the so-called Islamic threat is real. A thorough reading of the book left one convinced that such a threat is nothing but a myth. However, the unprecedented chromatic attacks of 9-11 have made so many Americans doubt Esposito's view. This implied that post-9-11 Islamophobia had donned a new clock that misunderstands Islam and re refuses to accept Muslims. Let me try to wrap up. The problem is that most of the issues raised against Islam may seem against the Western cultural agenda, but culturally, it's a matter of difference rather than opposition. What looks natural and normal in the West may not be accepted in the East, and the difference in cultural environment, geography, etc., plays an important role in shaping people's way of thinking and attitudes towards certain acts and phrases. And this is not confined to the Western culture, it's even about own culture as Arabs and Muslims. I, I still remember in 2003, I had a um, summer institute held in Cairo where a group of professors and faculty members from various universities, public universities in Egypt invited to attend a workshop by some faculty members from George Washington and Georgetown University. And my advisor was one of them, the head of this group. And she had a movie about the American culture which had some scenes which some of my colleagues in Egypt thought that this is not appropriate. And this is very offensive to display something like that. We have women, we have um, uh, people here who, who, who want or who wouldn't uh, be interested in watching such scenes. And uh, they refused to continue with the workshop. And um, they asked each one of us to talk about how he feel. This was organized by Fulbright. So Fulbright asked each one to talk about what, <clears throat> what are the, um, um, what is his stance or her stance towards what, what happened. And when I talked about the difference, we are different. Um, we belong to a different culture, to a different um, uh, country, and they came from a different culture. What might seem to us as an inappropriate might be appropriate for them. So don't judge people according to your values and according to your disciplines. The same thing has to be asked from the Western side. If you see a Muslim, if you see an Arab, and you don't like the way he's, he's acting or he's, the way he's um, doing, remember that he's coming from a different perspective. And um, 
This will lead us to the last um, interpretation of Islamophobia will take like five to seven minutes. Islamophobia as a myth or invention. In an essay entitled The Islamophobia Myth, Kanan Malik doubted the existence of Islamophobia. So the, he, he, he wondered if the term does really exist. He stated, quote, but does Islamophobia really exist? Or is the hatred and abuse of Muslims being exaggerated to suit politicians' needs and the silence of the critics of Islam? The trouble with Islamophobia is that it's an irrational concept. It confuses hatred of and discrimination against Muslims on the one hand with criticism of Islam on the other. The charge of Islamophobia is all too often used not to highlight racism but to, um, to, to, to fight against any type of criticism. So he puts a new dimension to the term Islamophobia. Um, as being a way to counteract those who criticize Islam and Muslims. In this way, the term itself instills fear rather than reflect fear from something. The mix between race, religion, and politics and the use of the term Islamophobia plays an important role in seeing the term as no more than an invention that serves the cert certain political agendas and threatens the U.S. itself. This is evident in the 2006 crisis of the proposed operational transfer of six major U.S. ports to a firm owned by the United Arab Emirates. I'm not sure if you remember this. This was in 2006. And in one of the, its editorials, Grand Rebel Press declared, quote, it's one thing for feckless grievance mongers on the left um, to accuse American generally concerned about national security of Islamophobia. It's quite another, um, it's quite another for the right to sink it to such a level in accusing all good faith critics of uh, demagoguery. The editor defends the rights of Americans to keep their land secure, even if this is going to be called Islamophobia. So we are not giving this to the, um, uh, the firm owned by United Arab Emirates because we are a little bit worried from Islamophobia. And the conclusion of that is that um, Islamophobia as a myth is that the result of some kind of losing credibility caused by incidents regarded as relating to the national security or by false accounts of hate crimes. Moreover, Islamophobia may in fact mean a rational fear of Muslims and Arabs, but the loss of the term is credibility along with the absence of any attempt to correct the image of Arabs and Muslims in the eyes of Western people may aggravate the situation and turn this more fear to hatred and violent actions against this minority. This is extremely evident in a story written by Karyan Kirkpatrick, we are already in World War III, and many people in the West are still in denial. Terrorism is not by accident. It's part and parcel of the religion and culture of jihad, of, of the march to, to world domination that has been growing for decades in the Islamic world." Unquote. Um, I know we have limited time, so in conclusion, the 9-11 after 9-11, the term Islamophobia has become very common in the U.S. newspapers. And the ambiguity of the term is evident in the different meanings it implies. The more people analyze and comment on the term, the more the term becomes equivocal. It's so strange that there is Islamophobia and not anti-Islamitism or anti-Muslim. The two terms, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, for example, are all juxtaposed in an attempt to prove the similarity or dissimilarity between them. Let's conclude this by getting close to each term through the linguistic microscope, the English dictionary. If we compare the meanings of the prefix anti and the suffix phobia in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia respectively, we will find the difference in the implication of each term. For example, Merriam-Webster Collegial Dictionary the 11th edition defines anti-Semitism as hostility toward or discrimination against the Jews or religious, ethnic, or racial group. This definition reflected the discrimination and hostility committed by anti-Semites against the Jews. On the other hand, Shorter Oxford Dictionary, 5th edition, defines Islamophobia as hatred of, or fear of Islam and Muslims, especially as a political force. The difference in the meaning conferred by the prefix anti and the suffix phobia is evident. 
The word phobia refers to the overall feeling of those who feel endangered. The coiner of the term Islamophobia cared more about those who hate than those who are hated. And while the coiner of the term anti-Semitism paid more attention to the feelings of the sufferers, in this way, it becomes important to take into consideration this linguistic dimension while juxtaposing the different interpretation of the term Islamophobia. It's this linguistic element that draws one's attention to the difference between the literal interpretation of the word Islamophobia as illogical, abnormal, fear of Islam, and the way the term is used to mean discrimination against Muslims. In comparing the term Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, it's also important to note the religious and ethnic dimensions included or excluded from the two terms. Anti-Semitism is used to refer to the political, social, and economic agitation and negative activities directed toward Jews. At the same time, the word might refer to the descendants of Shem, or Sam in Arabic. Thus, the term Semitism should have included Arabs, actually, and side by side with the Jews, but this was not the case. The Arabs are sometimes even accused of being anti-Semitic, which means Arabs being anti-Arab. On the other hand, the term Islamophobia is used to refer to hatred and fear of Muslims and Arabs, whether Muslims or non-Muslims. Here, one finds the term is going against its literal meaning. In the U.S. press, one of the meanings of Islamophobia is a form of racism. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, racism is a belief or ideology that all members of each race possess characteristics or abilities specific to that race, especially to distinguish it as being either superior or inferior to another race or races. And Merriam Webster's Dictionary defines racism as a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities and that racial difference produces an inherent superiority or, or of a particular race and that it's also the prejudice based on such a belief. In all these definitions, racism has something to do with one's race but not religion. This adds to the results of this research, which can be summarized by saying that the term Islamophobia remains a torn between different readings that are far away from dictionary meaning of the term. The term, which is always monoculturally defined, needs some kind of a multicultural interpretation that's capable of absorbing the various dimensions of its meaning. Thank you so much. So the question is, who in the United States is behind uh, funding uh, the mass media to create fear of uh, Islamophobia? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, this is um, difficult to, to decide, I mean, who is like, to identify a certain party, this is responsible for whatever we have in the mass media there. Um, I think it might be like, um, um, a multiplayer game, like where so many people um, contributing to this, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Um, some people um, got their... Um, um, Is there any particular group? I, 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 I cannot... Zen, Zen, yeah. Zen? Um, it's, it's, we will, if we go this way, I think we will do the same thing which is, uh, which is being done in, with regard to Islamophobia. Like identifying a certain group, this is the group responsible for all bad evils in the world. This is not, this should not be the case. I mean, um, what we can do in this regard, when we see some kind of misinformation or some kind of, um, 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 some, news stories in the, in the mass media which accuse Muslims of so and so. We just keep clarifying the situation, but um, to focus on identifying who is responsible for this, who's got this, we are going the same track people do with Islam, using Islamophobia. Um, I don't want like to, to use Islamophobia in the third meaning of it, uh, which I mentioned, Islamophobia as an invention, as a myth, to um, like fight against any criticism. No, just go ahead and express yourself in the newspapers. But there should be some people who read about Islam, who has good information about the religion and about the people and about the culture to um, inform people and um, provide them with some good resources in this regard. 
So the question is, how can we involve um, more people in an intelligence discourse on a topic uh, such as what we are addressing tonight? Yeah, that's, that's, this is a very good question. I mean, um, we need to um, um, bring people into this kind of discussion where you, you are not like taking my criticism of your attitude or your, your own criticism of my attitude as being something um, against you as, as much as to clear yourself, explain yourself very well. This is what we need. I think that uh, social media is right now playing a very important role in this regard. And um, soon after the Arab Spring um, being uh, like totally funded by social media. So um, I don't mean the literal meaning of the word funded, but social media plays a very important role in the Arab Spring. And, um, and um, um, to all my surprise, I was like following up what's going on with regard to Egypt uh, in particular. And um, the most famous Facebook page, for example, Kuluna Khalid Saeed, or We Are All Khalid Saeed, the Facebook page of the revolution, has an English version. And many people from the West, from um, England, from France, from Italy, from the United States, from Canada, contributed to this page, supporting those young people. And some of them started like asking questions about, um, about you, about, about Arabs, about Muslims, about your religion, um, etc. cetera. Um, 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 I was surprised to find some people asking if the revolution you are making right now is against Islam or not. Does Islam support revolution against the unjust rulers or not? So this kind of conversation between the people over social media is, is important. And um, the, 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 the younger generations in, 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 the, in, the, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world in general, are actually um, uh, more open to discussion. And the, the social media and uh, um, um, the way that the whole world becomes like a small village, as we say, uh, help those young people to uh, initiate this type of conversation and uh, put everything under um, criticism and under being evaluated and uh, discussed, etc. Um, I have many colleagues in, in, in Egypt who are under 35 years with PhDs and right now writing in political science. And they are right now writing about the whole history of um, um, political Islam and criticizing it in, in, in a way I couldn't imagine. I myself, like when I was in Egypt um, 10 years ago, I couldn't imagine someone to talk about uh, political Islam in such a way. So people right now are open to such a discussion, are initiating it in, in, a, in, a, in a healthy way to bridge any gaps between the two regions, the two nations, um, between the people in the West and the people in the East. And um, even Arab Americans, Muslim Americans are doing also a good job in this regard. And many of them keep like informing people, keep uh, uh, bringing their attention to many of the values in Islam that are not in, 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 uh, that are not against the values in the West, but they are the same. I was teaching my students a class in, at George Washington University talking about the values of America. And when I brought some from some resources how these values are actually included in the Quran, included in the Islam, so we are not against each other. Each other. We are on the same ground. We have the same values. So. Uh, you said there's a question for Adam, but I haven't seen the essence. So the comment is that uh, if Islam is not a monolith, how come it's being represented as it is? Uh, sometimes we talk about the actions of Muslims as being Islam in itself. There are so many incidents in the Islamic history, which if we evaluate them, generally we will find that these incidents are against Islam. Islam is what you find in the holy book of Muslims, which is the Quran. And in, when you go to the Quran and you find this kind of tolerance of the different values mentioned in the Quran, and instead, if, if I am from the West, if I'm not an Arab and a Muslim, and if I'm a Western guy, and I would like to, I, I know that those people are human just like me. I would like to bridge any gap of difference between me and them. What I, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna focus on whatever is negative about them or just try to find the positive side and build this bridge between us. And, um, and 
Uh, I think after 9-11, for example, and when many people talked about that Muslims are, re are, represent, uh, are responsible for what happened in 9-11 attacks, and that um, the majority of Muslims, as, as was evident in, in the polls conducted by Gallup organization, which is an American organization, conducted in five big Arab Muslim countries, the answer to the question, do you hate Americans, do you hate Western people, was no, we don't hate them. We just hate the foreign policy of the U.S. in our region. And when people ask it about um, the, what do you like most about the West, the majority, more than 85%, comes to we like the, their democracy, their freedom, etc. So it's, it's not as it is represented in the media. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> yes. So the question is that if uh, there is, you know, moving away from vague and mass generalizations, if there is a genuine interest in moving forward, in forward thinking terms, uh, is there a possibility that it would end Islamophobia? I, I, I think education is the way to get out of all of these phobias. To educate people about their religion, their life, similarities and dissimilarities they have with the other nations. And um, some, some of, of the phobias in the Arab world, or in the Muslim world in general, are actually culturally more than they are related to the religion itself. So, as, as, as in, in one of the articles I quoted from in, in this paper, um, education plays a vital role in this regard. And I think with, with, the, with the open doors right now, everywhere in the world, where people, you cannot make control over information coming from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world right now. And I was just mentioning how those young people in the Arab world right now, talk about some, some stuff in the, in, the, in the history of Islam which they don't like or they would like to think about it. And they are quoting from the Quran, um, quoting verses from the Quran that invite man to think about anything. And even in order to know God and that there is God and you have to worship God, you have to think about it. Because if you inherit it from your parents, you will not be um, a faithful Muslim. So thinking about everything, um, is, is in process right now, and no topos at all. I think that there is no topos right now in the Arab world, and especially after the Arab Spring, everyone is talking about anything he wants to talk about. And um, this was not the case 10 to 15 years ago. Um, social media, again, plays a very important role in this regard. Hopefully I answered I'm so sorry, but because we have limited time. Uh, interesting question whether Islamophobia could also be fear not just of outsiders towards Muslims but also Muslims against other Muslims <laughs> or, or uh, Muslims interpreting others. The fear of, fear of other Muslims, could, could we interpret that as Islamophobia? I, I, I think that um, um, some Muslims right now, um, especially with them, political Islam coming to power in some of the Arab countries after the Arab Spring. And the bad experience they got from um, um, Muslim Brotherhood and um, Salafis, etc. And um, some Muslims became um, very cautious about some of those who kept like talking about Islamic values, but in practicing they don't have these Islamic values in their practice. So this might be considered some type of phobia against um, uh, if you find someone who is religious in, the, in, in, in some parts of the Egypt, and then you find him religious, he has a beard, or a woman wearing uh, niqab, not hijab is common, but niqab, for example, you become like cautious about it because you think about Muslim Brotherhood, which is not, I, I don't agree with that, of course, because it's not, it's not correct to judge people on how they look without even talking to them and uh, try to understand why they are doing this or that. So I think after the, 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 the um, bad experience people had in, in, in um, I'm focusing only on 15% of the Muslim nation, which is in the Arab world right now. Um, in the Arab world, the bad experience that they had with the political Islam left people with some kind of uh, being cautious about any um, um, 
display of some religious beliefs. Um, yeah, I'm talking about Muslims, yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess the summary of your comment is what role anti intellectual, the trend of anti intellectualism plays or ignorance plays in um, anti-pluralistic attitudes that, mm -hmm. that have developed, especially in, in the United States. And it's taken as a virtue. And it's taken as a virtue, certainly. We know nothing. The answer is included in the question. <laughs> it's true. Um, so is Islamophobia and Orientalism related or not? Of course they are related. Um, that's why we, 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 when we mm -hmm. trace the, the, the history of um, the term itself, we said that it started in the UK in the 1990s, but it has, the fear from Islam has a very long history. And uh, Edward Said, in, uh, uh, whether in Orientalism or in covering Islam, um, he, he gave so many um, um, uh, examples from the history, from the very long history between the East and the West, where um, the misrepresentation of the other has taken place. And, um, and Islamophobia in this context is, in, in our reading of the, of, of the term in, in the US newspapers, has been um, subject to some kind of misrepresentation. If you are talking about all Muslims, all Arabs as terrorists, you are misrepresenting those people. If you're talking about all Muslims are Arabs and all Arabs are terrorists, you are misrepresenting those people. So um, Orientalism being based on the idea of misrepresentation, the idea of um, uh, um, like making the other passive and talking about it, um, introducing it in, in a way that serves the uh, interests, some, some political interests, um, it has something to do with Islamophobia. And, um. So I guess the summary is what role did the media uh, play in uh, playing up the fear uh, which led to real destruction in terms of invasion of uh, countries such as Iraq and Afghanistan? If we go back to the Crusades, for example, there is um, a version of the Quran that has been translated 100 years before the Crusades and sent to the West by someone named Peter something. And um, I was able to get um, like some parts of this copy and the translation is awful. It has nothing to do with the Quran. And um, when, when I started like looking at, looking at this as a way of trying to build up something in the minds of the people about those people in the, in the Arab world who are, um, committing some crimes against Christians living there, etc. It has some, some relation, of course. I mean, to prepare people for a war you intended to do by misinforming them about this other, um, this, is, this is the way how politics play. And the same thing happened in, in, the, in the war in Iraq. And talking about the... Um, uh, uh, massive um, weapons, or what do you call it? Uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, yeah, weapons of mass destruction, which was discovered to be a lie. And uh, it was just to be able to get the common will of the people by misinforming them. And then, of course, after discovering that this was a lie, and, uh, and uh, I, I always tell my friends that if we don't have George W. Bush, we don't have Obama. So to have Obama come to, as the first African-American president, you should have George W. Bush before him. And um, in 2005, I talked about a seminar I attended. And part of this seminar was to meet with people in the um, uh, Department of State. And we met with the vice minister of the Department of State. And we, we were a group of people coming from the Arab world. I was representing Egypt, but we have a professor from Iraq. And this, this guy kept talking about Americans went to Iraq to, Iraq is going to be the first Arab democracy ever. Mm -hmm. And we are doing so and so. So what I did after he finished his talk, I raised my hand, I told him, I'm so, so happy to hear about that. We all love Americans, but let me do something. Let's ask the, the Iraqi professor, I talked to her before the, that uh, uh, seminar, and she related horrible things. She got her cousin shot in the street for no reason. Just they, 
they considered him a suspect. And they shot him, the American soldiers. So the lady, the professor, started relating these stories. And she kept weeping for like 20 minutes, relating these stories and telling people, we, we hated Saddam, but we hate you more than Saddam. And now we want Saddam to be back. And when she said so, I felt how people, because we have some American audience, and they, they, they were shocked. And after, after we finished, they kept talking to her. We Americans didn't know about that. We thought our soldiers are there to save your lives, to help you get democracy you need, etc. So I totally agree with you that media and the being used by politicians to serve their ends is there. It's not only about um, some unintentional um, uh, misknowledge about or misinformation about the, 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 the Muslims, about the race, about the, the religion. It's some t sometimes it's intentional and it's used for politics. And this is politics everywhere, not only in, in North America, even in Egypt, even in, any, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, any Arab country, any Muslim country, politics always is used to serve um, uh, using religion, using any, anything to serve their ends. Oh, officially, we're beyond our time, but after your last comment, then we will, uh, we will close. Well, uh, did you, uh, well, the question is whether you used the um, uh, database search for... Uh, yeah, I used Lexus. So, yeah, so it would be automatic. So the yeah, yeah. you just bought the term and it brings whatever is mentioned, yeah. like so how many times... Oh, I see. So what he's saying is that could you have um, the recurrence of the term within the articles, you know, calculated by a machine rather than you reading all of those? Audio no, no. LexisNexis, uh, LexisNexis is doing the job. Yeah, yeah. Like how many times that the term is mentioned and how many articles and yeah, but then you have to actually read, read the article. Yeah. The yeah. yeah that, this is what I said. I said um, I got like 570 something mention of the term. So instead of like going into every single article, I just choose those articles that has Islamophobia in the title. Or the lead, yeah. Yeah, or the lead paragraph. Words, basically, they have, for example, like the word terrorism. Mm -hmm. so like, predominantly used for you know, Muslim crimes, and not say other mm -hmm. crimes. Mm -hmm. A press have works where basically they attempt to automate, you know, like um, have articles in the press where in the neighborhood of the term terrorism, basically they see, you know, how often, you know, or that for comparative purposes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting thought. Interesting yeah. thought. One last comment and then we shall close. Well, I just, uh, I'm just like, but is the, any, any study done in Canada about Islamophobia? Mm -hmm. All these done is in the States. What about Canada? Um, I'm a little there bit are. new to Canada, so Maybe. I'm trying right now to learn about the research in uh, with regard to yeah. um, Islam and Arabs and Arab Canadians in Canada. I'm trying right now to. There are some studies, and one of our own professors yeah, uh, at Wilfrid Laurier, Professor Jasmine Zain, that's one of her areas of research. Yeah. Thank you very, very much for your wonderful time, and thank you all for being here.